Hey everyone, um, good afternoon. Welcome to the first Compass Lecture of the semester. My name is Gina Kwan. Um, I am a co-coordinator. Uh, Isha Nayak is also the other coordinator, Isha. Yay! <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know that much about Compass, Compass is just an on-campus community of undergraduate and graduate students, and we all basically just love physics. And everything about physics, like physical sciences. Yeah, yay! Yay! <laughs> um, this semester, Isha and I have worked hard to put together a really awesome set of um, lectures from lecture series. So we have everything from climate science to astronomy, superconductors, lasers, you know, all that good stuff. So um, besides the lecture series though, Compass also has a summer program. We have a mentorship program, office hours, and a problem solving class for freshmen. And through these, basically our goal is just to help lessen the stress and difficulties of being a student in physical sciences. Um, today, Compass would like to thank the Graduate Assembly for funding our tea and cookies as well as Alex Jacobson for filming. And now, um, Brendan will introduce today's speaker. Hi, hi everyone, I'm Brendan O'Hare. Um, thanks for coming to the first uh, Compass Lecture Series uh, this semester. Um, Chancellor Bergenau, the Toronto name, attended the University of Toronto, originally on a scholarship for Greek and Latin studies. This unlikely start for a physicist arose from attending a boys' high school which rewarded its highest achievers by replacing science classes with classic studies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chancellor Burge now switched to math and science in college, much to the ire of his high school classics teacher who said, anyone can do physics, but very few people can do classics. <laughs> <laughs> After being undecided among the sciences, Chancellor Burge now eventually switched from math to physics in his final semester of undergraduate study in Toronto. His skill and interest in physics resulted in a research opportunity the summer following his undergraduate studies. His publication, still sometimes referred to today, uh, propelled him into his graduate study at, of physics at Yale. Graduating with a PhD in 1966, Chancellor Bergenau studied a year in Oxford, as well as a few years at Bell Laboratories. He then joined the physics faculty at MIT, eventually becoming the department chair and later the dean of science there. Chancellor Bergenau uh, returned to the University of Toronto to become the 14th president in 2000 and then was appointed Chancellor of Berkeley in 2004, as well as having a faculty <coughs> position in physics and material science and engineering. Chancellor Bergenau's research, while competing for time with his current position, involves experiments with superconductors, as well as the study of liquid crystals. Chancellor Bergenau feels like his work on larger projects in physics, involving coordinating engineers, physicists, and other personnel with strong egos, helped him prepare the difficulty of, of his position here at Berkeley. In his off time, Chancellor Bergenau enjoys following sports, playing squash, and spending time with his wife, Mary Catherine, and his four children and nine grandchildren. Now, please help me in welcoming Chancellor Robert Bergenau. So the story about my high school teacher is absolutely true. Actually, he was really upset when I used my classic scholarship to study uh, math, physics, and chemistry. Math, physics. Uh, and he really did say that. Uh, showed you how we physicists are not properly appreciated. People think anyone can do physics. The second thing is, uh, one of my embarrassments in life, uh, well, it wasn't so embarrassing to go to Yale, actually, it was a good experience. But, <laughs> but uh, I turned down graduate school at Berkeley, not because I didn't know that Berkeley was a better place, but because my wife on the East Coast refused to come west. And so, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't my wife then, she was my girlfriend. Was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and now my wife. Uh, so, I made a right decision then, and I finally got to Berkeley with my joke with, um, I, I was a student at, uh, at MIT when I was in the faculty, my joke was that you know, I could never manage to get a faculty position in physics through the direct route of getting them actually just to hire me. So I had to come here as chancellor as a backdoor. They were forced to give me a faculty appointment. <laughs> Sometimes, in not too distant future, I'll just be an ordinary professor of physics and be able to dress like this all the time and try to hang out with my graduate students. But, uh, instead of having to protest and scream. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, and, you know, I'm, th this will be primarily, being like senior undergraduate students, first year graduate students, that's my understanding of the trend where I'm going. And I'll basically talk until the hour is up. And, and just see how far I get. And the field of superconductivity actually isn't even my own field for certain. 
hadn't been uh, until uh, it would be a critical point in my career when I'll tell you about it, it's in the subject. So it was sort of fun preparing a talk because I decided to go back to uh, 1911 and therefore I got to educate myself a little bit on the history of, of this uh, field of this remarkable phenomenon of superconductivity. Uh, and it's turned out to be uh, a surprisingly rich field, which I think any of the senior people have done that even certainly agree. Yeah, that that uh, this field has ended up having a richness that none of us expected. Uh, and, and I'll talk about the richness and why uh, many of us continue to work on the properties of materials that exhibit superconductivity. So uh, I, it took me a little while to quote unquote get going here in Berkeley. Uh, somehow or other, they didn't tell me what the full range of responsibilities would be as chancellor. So I, the, uh, I thought I could do it three days a week and do physics with the other four. But that, didn't quite turn out to be true. Uh, oh, but uh, uh, we now now have a research group that's actually going pretty well. They have some pretty talented people in it. Uh, and uh, these are they, mostly postdocs actually. So Edith Bray for Chesney, uh, who's uh, at Boris Berkeley Lab. She plays a critical role in our group. Uh, and I'll explain as we get, as I get into, especially the modern, the superconductors old and new, when I get to new superconductors. One of the things I'm going to explain is that if you want to play a leadership role in the field, you can't spend your time on the telephone begging your colleagues in other universities or, other, or in other countries to send you crystals or to send you materials. Uh, and so if you want to do really creative research, you can't just be a physicist. You have to be a chemist and a material scientist as well. Otherwise, you're going, going to be lagging other people. Uh, and so we learned that really well. I already knew that. Uh, in, when I worked in other fields, but we learned that really well when the family of materials called high temperature superconductors were discovered. Um, so it turned out that when I arrived here at Berkeley, uh, here in the physics department, uh, a little bit to my surprise actually, that in the department and even up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, <clears throat> we did not have nationally competitive facilities to grow single crystals. So it was not something I anticipated. So that meant that the first year or so of my life as a physicist, rather than as chancellor here, was actually devoted to figuring out how we would do this, and frankly, to raising the money. And even if you're chancellor, you just can't say it's $2 million dollars <laughs> set up a lab, right? You have to compete just like, like everyone else. So we did. But I was very lucky that there was, uh, up in Lawrence Berkeley Lab, a uh, research scientist Edith Gray from Chesney, who in fact had spent some time at MIT, uh, who was an expert crystal grower and who was very interested in expanding the range of her abilities to and, and, and techniques to include the class of materials that she was interested in. Uh, and then postdoc, Roger Freeland, uh, joined me. Uh, you'll recognize his name, Alessandro, one of the professors in the physics department, one of the people we collaborate with. Castel uh, Rokundu came from the uh, University of Maryland. Join us. Stephen Wilson came from Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, he's a good news, bad news story. Good news <coughs> is he's extraordinarily talented, and so he was a great addition to my group. Bad news is he's so talented that it barely turned up. He did one experiment right away that was really as important, and then he got a faculty position and he's already left. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the kind of thing, of course, professors like me love that because we you want your students and postdocs to be successful, on the other hand. Is, uh, it was almost a virtual transition from here to Berkeley and that. Uh, uh, one graduate student in my group, Patrick Valdivia, uh, uh, who's actually in the material science department. Uh, we have a collaborator, Zara Yamani. Uh, I was on her thesis project, <coughs> thesis committee at the University of Toronto. Uh, she did a wonderful PhD thesis in the, using NMR techniques in the field of high temperature superconductivity. Uh, so, uh, so I got to befriend uh, her at the time, and now she's uh, one of our principal collaborators uh, using the nuclear reactor. And I'll tell you a little bit about that at uh, uh, Chalk River. Uh, so I'm using undergraduate's work in our group. I want to give a special acknowledgement that he would be here, except that he's co-hosting another talk in pure science. And that's uh, Roman Murphy Ramesh, who's also, like me, a professor in both the physics department and in the material science department. 
and who was really critical in helping me organize things and, uh, and <coughs> put together uh, collaborations and research funding practice to start my research program. So my talk is four parts. As I said, I'll just uh, get as far as I can. Uh, and and uh, if I don't get all the way through, maybe you'll invite me back next year. I'll <laughs> the last part of the talk. So I'll tell you a little bit about the history, which is just sort of fun. Uh, I'll give you a few of the anecdotes. I'll tell you a little bit about traditional superconductors. Those are superconductors where the binding mechanism of the electrons uh, it is uh, just a distortion of the lattice of the photons. Uh, then I'll tell you about the discovery of the copper oxide superconductors. Uh, that happens to be a situation where the lead person in that, I know very well personally, is interacting with him. Uh, I was not in administration then, it was just physics. Uh, and and uh, uh, so I sort of got to the true part of the discovery, the high temperature superconductors, which has been this field, which has been so important. Uh, and then uh, very recently, actually just in 2008, uh, a new family of superconductors got discovered based on uh, iron and uh, nictides. Nictide means uh, uh, the role that has nitrogen, arsenic, or, uh, not nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic. It used to be, if you want to work in my research group, you had to be able to do that. It shows a chance to make your brain dead. I used to be able to take any role in the periodic table and tell you every single atom. But I can't do that anymore, as, you, as I just illustrated. <laughs> oh, and Tony. Thank you. There was a famous professor at UCSD by the name of Derek Nikias, one of the best material scientists in the country. I was a graduate student. Came and wanted to join his group, he would walk out for a period of time and put his hand over an atom. And if the graduate student couldn't name it, they didn't get into a third place. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so uh, the field of superconductivity has been very generous to physicists uh, because, in all, there have been this string of Nobel Prizes so far in, in the field of superconductivity. The very first one was given to uh, Cameron Onis, and I'll tell you a little bit about that the sociology of it. get the superconductivity was only part of why we got the Nobel Prize. It was really for lipofat, helium, uh, which led to the discovery. Uh, it's a little bit like Einstein getting the Nobel Prize not for relativity or something else. Uh, but uh, uh, he discovered superconductivity in 1911. I'll tell you about that. Then there was this wonderful theory produced by three people, John Marine, uh, Leon Cooper, and Bob Schrieffer. Cooper, I only met once or twice. Walt invented the transistor. So, for those of you who are this in your careers, this man was very, was very humble. He died uh, not so long ago. He was a very humble, self effacing person, and he managed to discover the transistor and to uh, produce the theory of the theory of superconductivity, which is not bad. So, so inspired. <laughs> uh, and then, already the next year after that uh, tunneling, which, uh, of course, our own John Clark is one of the world's great people because tunneling experiments this kind of story, right? So the Nobel Prize for tunneling went to these three uh, gentlemen. Then in 1987, and I'll tell you a little bit about the sociology surrounding this, George Ben North and Alec Mueller discovered uh, this a whole new family of materials which really has called uh, high temperature superconductors and it has changed the paradigm uh, in, in not just in superconductivity but in our whole area of condensed solid state physics in uh, its entirety. Uh, and then, very late on in 2003, the Nobel Prize was given to Albert Fassoff, Ginsburg, and Lega, who are throughout the business, who uh, made historic contributions to understanding aspects of superconductors and superfluids. Uh, Lega for actually superfluid helium 3, and Albert Fassoff and Ginsburg for ordinary superconductors, regular superconductors. And Ginsburg just died quite recently. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to add to this picture, but this shows you the superconducting transition temperature as a function of time. This is a famous graph uh, <laughs> I got from a person who was working at Bach, who was at Bell Labs at the time, A.J. Uh, Hoffman. And what you'll see is superconductivity was discovered in material mercury. I'll tell you what that 
shortly. Uh, and then almost immediately afterwards, they measured the resistance of lead. I discovered that the lead at this temperature was around 7 degrees. The transition, super, the resistance went to zero. Uh, and then what happened is that then someone looked at niobium. And then they discovered that by looking at, at niobium type materials, so these are 4D transition metal materials, that they were able to progressively by good material size, increase the superconducting transition temperature. And they got it up about 20 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and niobium wires are the basis of most of the practical, large-scale practical applications <coughs> of superconductivity still. Like in, in Maggie, if you go, you have know, a misfortune, uh, as I did uh, not so long ago, of wrecking your knee, and, and uh, therefore you have to get an MRI to look at the inside of your knee to see what you tore up. Uh, then uh, down in uh, uh, all the all the states. Uh, then the super the MRI machine uses iodine type wire, iodine wire. Uh, I actually had my first personal introduction to superconductivity uh, in the material with eighty three silicon, and so I and some of my colleagues, was one of my first projects as an independent scientist, uh, looked at the phonons in the material because of phonon mediated superconductivity. And these materials, all of them, which are high temperatures, have the oddity that, that the structure distorts just before they became a superconductor. And many people felt that the fact that the structure distorted and that they had high temperatures, quite high temperatures, the superconducting temperatures must be connected in, that, in some way. Um, OK. So then what happened is that you see something just took off in a way that's uh, pretty ordinary. So, uh, I don't remember the exact years you were a student at MIT, but the uh, or postdoc, were you a student or postdoc? Uh, both. Both, yeah, right, okay. Anyway, I was teaching the undergraduate solid state physics course at MIT in, in 1986. And uh, it was sort of last year undergraduate first year planning to school. And I remember students in the class would always come because they were looking for advice on where to go to graduate school or what, looking for a thesis advisor. And I remember explicitly saying to the students who came to Talk to me for advice, but whatever you do, don't go into the field of superconductivity because it's completely finished. <laughs> Not even to learn to this is literally true. Okay, so maybe you should believe everything I say from now on, based on this incredible foresight that I show. <laughs> and I had already had my conversation with Alex Mueller, who made this discovery before saying that. So anyway, I still feel bad. But okay. Uh, in any case, so then what happened is there was a discovery made of some new materials. Uh, based on copper and oxygen, very unexpected, even more unexpected than you could ever imagine, and I'll explain why. Uh, and this has gone all the way up under pressure to above 160 degrees Kelvin, which still sets the record. It's pretty remarkable. But actually, I think more senior people here would agree, even if that, instead of being 160, it was 16, the materials would still be as remarkable in terms of trying to understand the physics. The fact that they're superconductors at all is remarkable, much less superconducting at record high temperatures. And I'll try to explain why that's the case. So this is uh, uh, Kamerling Onis in his uh, lab uh, in, in uh, 1911. And this is one of his technicians. And uh, so in reading up a little bit about Kamerling Onis, most of this I knew in advance. So, but in any case, I'm reminding myself, one of the interesting things is that uh, and really what underlay Kamerling Onus's uh, genius was his respect for staff and his understanding that if you wanted to do world class experimental research, you had to have really good technical people work with you and you had to treat them with dignity, uh, which he did. And so he had a special school for training to these technicians. And so uh, these technicians, and there were seven of them, and they wore, wore blue jackets, so they were called blue boys, even though they didn't exactly look like a boy. So maybe there was still some hierarchy in this French culture. But, uh, but anyway, so these people then, uh, he set out, his goal was to liquefy helium, helium gas, to see if you could turn it into a liquid. Uh, and so all of this apparatus was uh, an apparatus which was based on uh, with the Jules Hoffman effect to basically liquefy helium. And they succeeded, so they were the first people on the planet to liquefy helium, uh, which liquid, which uh, Ordinary temperatures, uh, uh, sorry, uh, atmospheric pressure uh, liquefies at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. And so 
So this meant you then could have sampled that, held it at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, and if you pumped on the liquid, you could pump it down uh, through the super fluid pressure, actually down to uh, just above one degree. So this was an extraordinary technical achievement. Uh, now I've heard, I've read two different conflicting stories of what I'm now about to tell you. So I'll tell you the story I like best. Uh, and, and if you are interested in the history of science, you can research it and maybe someday come back and tell me which one is true. I'm only, I'm only going to tell you the one I like. So what I like is, uh, and also makes sense to me, I mean, it's what I would, so that's probably why I like it. So there was a debate at the time about the resistance of resistivity of metals. Uh, and there were some people who felt that uh, liquid metals would have very different behavior than solid metals, because the solids had periodic structures that was known at that time, because Frags were with x-rays. So Kamerling Mahonis then decided that <laughs> one of his first experiments he should do with liquid helium, because he could go to very low temperatures was to stick a couple of electrodes, actually more fancy apparatus than that, <laughs> holding uh, liquid mercury, and then to cool it down to see what happened to the resistance of the liquid mercury when you went into the, when, when it solidified, so it went from the liquid phase to the solid phase. That's sort of a nice idea in a very elegant way to do it. Right? So then what happened, however, is that when they did that, actually not much happened. Because if you're at relatively high temperatures, it turns out the resistance is not very different in, in metals and the solids because technical terms are populated with most of the phonons and they don't care whether or not you have a periodic lattice. Okay. But then the graduate student kept cooling sample down because he now had liquid helium. Uh, and he could go by pumping on it to below 4.2 degrees. And he did this, and a step, an astounding thing happened, which is the resistance. Whatever the units are, looks um, like just ohms. Okay, dropped precipitously to zero. So the graduate student was extremely upset by this because, because it, uh, what's saw a picture of the apparatus and it was quite elegant. And so he felt his apparatus had failed because the leads must have come unattached or something like that. Because the idea that resistance would suddenly just go away, that you could have something that was would conduct electricity perfectly. So counterintuitive because everyone thought of electrons going along and you know, banging into other atoms, etc. Right? So it's completely counterintuitive. So then the student went back, tried it again, got the same answer, and then he went and discussed it with Cameron Onus, and Onus gave him some suggestions, also said it was a mistake, and gave him some suggestions for modifying his apparatus. He modified the apparatus, he went back, and guess what? The same thing happened again. So then he went to a professor and said, you know, Whenever I do this, I get you know, this crazy behavior where the resistance goes away. So then Onus decided he would have to do it himself. And so Onus then went into, into, into the lab, repeated the measurements himself, and got exactly the same answer. And for this reason, Onus got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> and the student did not. <laughs> However, I heard the, the, the student later became the head of research at Flux, so he ended up not having such a bad uh, actually, Nobel Prize technically wasn't for this discovery, it was for the liquefaction of uh, helium, even though people usually say it's for discovering superconductivity. So, this is pretty remarkable, actually, this idea that the resistance is to go to zero. And this attracted a lot of attention. Uh, and it went on for 50 years with very, very smart people. So, it was a long time, 50 years, with very smart people, or 45 to be precise. Very smart people trying to, like Landau and Ginsburg, et cetera, London, trying to figure out you know, what is the microscopic physics. And there were all kinds of clever ideas. Uh, and it wasn't until 1956, that's when I published the paper, I guess it was the year before, that uh, Bob Schrieffer had been, who's the fellow on the left, uh, had been an undergraduate at MIT. Uh, and he learned about superconductivity and he learned about all of the troubles people were having. And he knew there was a super smart guy who was acting like an engineer, technically. John Mardin, but in the physics department at the University of Illinois, who discovered the transistor. It's pretty good. He's a really smart guy. So, uh, and, and so I should go to graduate school at the University of Illinois in order to work for Mardin. And he actually went to work on the theory of superconductivity. And he had some good luck. He may have done it anyway. But his good luck was there was a 
nuclear theorist by the name of Levi Cooper, who was also at, at uh, Illinois at the time, but also talked to Bardeen about the superconductivity problem. And he figured out this idea uh, for a single pair, just two electrons in a lattice, that if the lattice distorted uh, and the electrons took advantage of the distortion, that they could form a pair, uh, and that the pair would then have a gap between the ground state and the first excited state. It's a thing we all teach in an undergraduate uh, solid state physics courses. And so Bob Creeper knew about this idea, and he recognized immediately that this was the first step in real theory. But you need to do a real theory, you need to go from understanding the behavior of two electrons to understanding the behavior of 10 to the 23rd electrons. Okay. And that's the quantum many body problem. Uh, and so this was then theoretical breakthrough. Treefer told me he was uh, literally, he was back in Boston, he was literally sitting on a uh, street park, DMTA, sitting there daydreaming about it when the idea hit. Uh, I'm a very strong believer in daydreaming. <coughs> People who are too programmed <coughs> don't give up some things because well, certainly any, and I've made any important discovery, any discoveries I've made have come from daydreaming. So, anyway, so Schrieber was, uh, was uh, quite lucky that he had some time to try something on, on the MTA. So he then figured out basically the elements of what the theory should be. He decided he went back to Illinois and then worked with these two gentlemen especially John Bardeen, who was really a genius, uh, put together a comprehensive theory. And the basic idea uh, is that, that it's very crude. The electron goes by, the lattice distorts in response to that, and that, that makes it easier for the next electron to go by. And so this yields a net attractive interaction between the electrons, and they bind and form a pair. Uh, this is obviously really heuristic because, in fact, two electrons are going in the opposite direction. In fact, they have momentum k and minus k. Uh, and in an ordinary superconductor, they're typically, let's say, 500 angstroms apart. That's the characteristic size of the pair. So, right, that's very different from the new superconductors where the pairs are quite small, a couple of lots of lots. So this is a very beautiful and elegant theory, and it explains lots of things. And then the subsequent developments by people like Josephson, et cetera, Abercasa, Ginsburg, et cetera, the names I showed you, they then built on this theory and made a lot of predictions. Uh, and uh, <coughs> all worked very well. One of the most elegant uh, features <coughs> of ordinary superconductors is uh, the so called Meissner effect, which is that if you apply a magnetic field to a superconductor, then the superconductor will expel the magnetic field. Uh, and this gives you the phenomenon of levitation, which I'm sure you've seen done many times, where you can take a magnet, put it on top of a material that's superconducting, and the magnet will float. And that's just expelling the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, but the fact that superconductors that have a Meissner effect is actually important when we get on to the new class of materials, because one of the re a, a heuristic way of thinking about it is that in an ordinary superconductor where you form a pair, I didn't say it, but a critical aspect of having a pair is that the spins be in opposite directions. So they have momenta k and minus k, but the spins point in the opposite direction, so it's a net spin zero pair. Okay. So therefore, anything that will disturb the alignment of the spins disturbs the superconductivity because it affects the binding of the pairs. So superconductors don't like magnetic fields, and they absolutely hate having any odd spins sitting around. Because if you had an odd spin sitting around since they're 500 angstroms apart, you could imagine the pairs going along. There's a spin here. This electron sees the spin, flips, and then the electrons repel each other, and then you lose, you, you lose the binding of the two electrons. So you have the Meissner effect, both the Meissner effect and the fact that superconductivity is destroyed by very small numbers of magnetic impurities. Uh, and it's uh, fundamentally important. So, so our new keeper, Cooper Treeper, produced his theory. Or Margaret Cohen, Doug Scalapino, who's here visits a lot. Uh, and lots of people made really beautiful pieces of theoretical work on conventional superconductivity. There's a friend of mine by the name of Bill McMillan, who's also at Illinois, sadly got killed by riding his bicycle. Uh, produced a very elegant theory that showed, that really explained the fact that the transition temperatures were saturating. At, at below 30 degrees Kelvin. So he could explain quantitatively 
why you could get up to a 30 degrees Kelvin without the right. So that's sort of where things were. Uh, and since everything worked so well, there was all this elegant theory, that then underlies why I do a class just like this one, actually. You know, in 1986, and, you know, I just don't, I can identify other areas of physics where there are really profoundly, profound questions where we don't know the answers. But superconductivity seems to be quite far, uh, quite far along. Uh, okay. Then these two gentlemen came along. Oh. <laughs> 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 I was giving this guy the same lecture. <laughs> he looks very interested, don't you think? <laughs>
absolutely true story. Right? So, so uh, it, it turned out, by the way, his motivation was completely wrong. It was black hole, actually. In fact, I was correct. <laughs> Not that he was great yet, because when I tell you what he did, it's the exact opposite. But his motivation was, was, uh, was completely off and was bad physics. Uh, but it proved, and how I'm going to describe it to you now, what a great scientist. So he knew that he, so he coupled to this, he knew that, <laughs> <laughs> so he knew, so he decided it was really in a way following this theoretical paper and some work done here at Berkeley, theoretical work, uh, that he decided he was going to look in perovskite materials. Uh, but, you know, in Marvin's work here, I mean, I think that's super at one degree or something, right? And he wanted to break the world's record, right? With the, with the, very strange mechanism. But he knew he had to start making some new materials. So he called in uh, George Bendorts, who was a materials chemist, and said, let's partner on this project and explain to him what he wanted to do, etc. So, uh, so they worked together and worked together and worked together. Then it turns out, without going through all the details, that the particular mechanism that is going to give high temperature superconductivity rested on a phenomenon called the Yon Teller effect. Uh, which I had written some papers on, so I knew a lot about it. That's one reason why I knew that his ideas didn't really make sense. It's just something I've done personal research on myself, a pretty sophisticated understanding. And in the Jan Teller effect, you, you have an atom in a very high symmetry situation. Uh, it's high symmetry material, usually cubic. Uh, and the atom has, in its ground state, two levels that are degenerate. Not because of time reversal symmetry, but because of an accident. <laughs> and so the Jan Teller effect, discovered by Mr. Jan and Mr. Teller, uh, age long thing, uh, then realized that uh, materials don't like degeneracies, and that what they would do is they would spontaneously distort in order to lift the de degeneracy. And the idea was that this would then produce a very large electron phonon coupling and therefore high, very high temperature. I mean, the caveat in their logic is it will always distort first for it produce high temperature superconductor, it was right. But they didn't, didn't care. So what they decided to do is they would start synthesize, synthesizing materials where that were designed to be, that would be cubic and would have a transition metal with D electrons. And such that in that symmetry, when they did simple calculations for my symmetry, you'd have two levels that were degenerate. And then their idea is it would, you know, uh, this degeneracy would produce this large on teller effect, which would produce superconductivity high temperatures, if they could figure out how to cope it. So they started systematically with crystal chemistry, trying to make materials that were perfectly three-dimensional and perfectly cubic. So that otherwise the mechanism doesn't work. So they started making it, and they got this idea that they would work on lanthanum copper oxide, LaCuO3. And they would figure out how to dope it. And they decided that the way to dope it was to replace some of the lanthanum by barium. Lanthanum is 3 plus and barium is 2 plus, and that will give you some holes that can carry electricity. Okay. So they set out to do this. Then it turns out they make the material. I mean, they did a lot of work. Then they made the material, and then they discovered superconductivity at a record high temperature. In that case, it was in the thirds. Okay. Now, an ordinary person someone who's not as careful and as good as Alex Miller, would have then said, great, you know, I have this theoretical paper that predicted high temperature superconductivity, and I follow the recipe, and so the paper must be right, and I must be a genius, and so they then send the article off to Nature or Fizzred Letters or something like that. Right? Okay. Uh, but Alex was too good a scientist to do this. So they did two things. First of all, he knew this is the thing I admire most about him. And as he told me personally, you don't see this written anywhere, actually, uh, in any of the books about this field. He, he knew that the minute he, he let anybody at IBM know that they made this discovery, there would be a press release. And then there would be a worldwide uh, rush to start working on these materials. So if they had a technician, and they actually dismissed the technician, and literally, basically locked the laboratory door because he wanted the pure pleasure of the discovery. <laughs> it's absolutely true. This was a Nobel Prize discovery, and he just wanted to 
to the senior enough, the personal pleasure of making the initial discoveries uh, in this field. Okay. So, therefore, just no graduate students, no postdocs, just one curious guy and one quite senior physicist. So then, then they started doing systematic measurements, and, and then they discovered pretty quickly that, that they were able to isolate the material they were trying to make, and it wasn't superconducting at all, it was completely boring. And it turned out that Bednorth had made a mistake in chemistry, and it got the, had, got the, had mixed the materials slightly incorrectly, and so it wasn't in the exact ratio you needed to get the three-dimensional structure, and some material had separated off as they were off the superconducting. And it was the junk which turned out to be the superconductor. <laughs> and they figured that out. That's not true, actually. And it took them a significant length of time to isolate what was the junk and then figure out how to prepare the junk. The junk turns out not to be junk, but it's elegant and beautiful. <coughs> and, and, and it completely contradicts the theoretical picture. And I admire that, that you know, once they got going in the right direction, then, then they were in control of the physics, basically. Right? So the material, rather than being ideally three-dimensional, is actually ideally two-dimensional. And this is the parent material, lanthanum copper oxide, and it's made up of these are sheets of copper oxide, which are relatively well separated from each other. So that instead of being an ideal three-dimensional material, these are close to being ideally two-dimensional. That also turns out to be that turns out to be fundamental, and it also turns out to be characteristic of the newest family of superconductors. This, uh, so that was the lanthanum copper oxide. The next, actually, let me go ahead. Okay. After it was discovered, then there were a lot of people um, who said, well, it was 36 degrees or something, and Macmillan's theory said you couldn't get above 30. So there were a lot of people who said, this isn't special. But very quickly after that, then a fellow, who I also knew who I was Paul Chu, uh, got one of his former graduate students who was then at the University of Alabama by the name of Wu to take Ben Nortz's and Mueller's material and replace a lanthanum by yttrium. And their logic was yttrium is a smaller atom, and so you replace a large atom like lanthanum with a smaller atom like yttrium, and that's like applying pressure. So in the same way many people find transition temperatures go up if you squeeze the material, they thought let's squeeze it chemically. So they therefore did the same recipe as Bednorth had worked out. And oh, I didn't tell you when they decided to publish, I'll come back to it in a minute. They took the same recipe, uh, but they replaced that by Ithra. And then the same thing happened again, which is they got a completely different material, not the one we're trying to make, uh, whose structure I'll come back to. And this was really historic, because they discovered that this became superconducting at uh, above liquid nitrogen temperatures. And that gets up to 97 degrees Kelvin. So any way you tried to take the conventional theory at that time and distort it a little bit, you got up to 30 seconds, you couldn't explain transition temperatures up near 100. So at that point with this discovery, everyone recognized that this was, uh, this was completely new for them. Uh, how new? Even then, people didn't know, actually. Uh, it's new in a profound way. This the material that's superconducting above liquid nitrogen is called yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, and rather than having sheets of copper oxygen, it has a pair of sheets. They're still isolated from the others, so it's a bilayer material, but basically is in essence the same. Uh, this is the material that sets the world record. So this is the material which is again based on, and see it clearly here, but based on layers of copper oxide, uh, but in this case mercury, you have mercury instead of uh, lanthanum, and you put in a little barium and a little calcium, and you squeeze it, uh, and it's superconducting at 164 Kelvin, which is pretty remarkable. So let me come back uh, to Alex Miller. So they were in the lab for nine months, working away uh, on this, and they had done everything I said in terms of isolating what the material was. They were starting to characterize basic properties. They figured out that the two-dimensionality was fundamentally important. They figured that out on their own. It was all really very elegant. Uh, and then they saw a paper by a man at the University of Texas by the name of John Goodenough. Uh, he's a crystal chemist there, a very esteemed person. And he wrote a paper on the, this class of materials, and then they got scared to death that he was going to scoop them. Okay. 
and make the discovery. So then they decided that they'd better publish, that they had their nine months of fun uh, in, in, in the laboratory with the door locked. Uh, but, you know, a Nobel Prize after all is not so bad and so on. So probably you should publish in order to get your Nobel Prize. So they then did. Uh, but hoping that no one would see it, they published in Nitria Sur Physique, which was a historic German journal. Uh, <laughs> which now no longer exists even, actually. Right? Uh, and hoping no one would see it, but the exact opposite happened. And, and actually, Paul Truman and Victor discovered the article the day it was published, and like, the next day was already working on it. <laughs> so, it turns out, and not everyone, I'm not going to give you a little bit of the physics of these because I'm not going to spend too, much, too long on it. Uh, uh, this was discovered in 1987, it's now 2010, uh, 23 years later, and we still don't understand why these materials are superconductive. Okay. Now, there are people probably even in this department who disagree adamantly with me on that. That's my own personal view. We understand a lot of other materials, but we don't have a fundamental theory uh, of, of, of these materials. And it turns out it's uh, for reasons that uh, I will try and explain in a minute. So it turns out all people did wonderful materials research. And all of the high temperature superconductors until 2008 had this basic structure. Either one or maybe two or three layers of copper oxide. I'll show you that structure. And then something in between, which separates the layers. And so that is a charred reservoir layer. And this layer is the source of the holes or electrons <coughs> that fall down into the copper oxygen layer and then, and then provide the uh, carriers for the superconductivity. So these materials are almost ideally two dimensional. And th this is universal structure of these materials. And physicists love things that are universal because it then implies that you only need one theory. Right? Because if you if everything if all the structures are universal, then one theory will explain every single one of the theories. <laughs> and the next slide is not objectionable. Seriously, it's not, it's not the stick. I give the pop. It's the
And that he went the opposite limit and he said, well, not only are there spins, but the spins are the reason that it's a superconductor. Okay. And, and he said, so this is really, this is fundamentally new physics. And in his model, it was also fundamentally important that the material was two dimensional. Uh, and uh, produced a thing called the resonating valence bond model of superconductivity, which exploited both the fact that they were, uh, that the coppers had a single spin, it was critical that it was spin in half, so it was in the quantum limit, and it was critical that it was two dimensional. It's sort of very elegant and, and, uh, and beautiful and still possibly correct. So it was when Kastner, Mark Kastner and I read this paper that he said, hey, this is great, you know, because we haven't believed anything we've seen so far in the literature. And, and so this, uh, this then gives us a motivation to start working on this, uh, on this material. So then we discovered, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'll give you a talk for the second half later. <laughs> 45 minutes that goes through. I'll jump to the Joseph Joseph. Let me just tell you sociologically what happened. So, so uh, then we, we, we realized we needed to uh, uh, be able to make these materials that weren't going to be able to borrow. Uh, there happened to be a postdoc from Australia who was looking around for a problem. Uh, and this is, this you can do at MIT, you can't go do it verbally. Sad to say, it's the chancellor. So Catherine and I walked into the office of the vice president for research said we had this great idea, we, it was this new area of research, all the literature was incorrect except for this one brilliant paper and we knew how to pursue it, but we needed to set up a thicker kind of lab. And so in today's dollars, we needed about a half a million up front. Now, Anyway, so then we started making materials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me just jump some more. Okay, just show you the phase diagram and then I'm going to jump in. So the phase diagram of these materials turns out to be extraordinarily rich. So it turns out that when you start out with the parent material before you put in carriers, the material is an antiferromagnetic insulator. And in fact, now is the classic example of a two-dimensional quantum magnet. And there's a very, very beautiful theory done uh, by a, a number of theorists, but most especially Sudeep Chakamardi, who's a distinguished professor at UCLA, on theories of magnet, quantum magnetism dimensions that works quantitatively with no adjustable parameters. And we did a lot of work working together with him. So I spent a lot of time out here in California, but at UCLA actually working uh, commuting back and forth working with him. Uh, when you put in only 2% carriers, and I didn't explain uh, this was running out of time, it turns out that the carriers, you might have thought intuitively they sit on the copper. They actually don't sit on the oxygens. So it technically it's oxygen superconductivity. Amazing, which I didn't believe at all until some really beautiful experiments were done to demonstrate it. So you add about 2% holes on the oxygen, and the magnetism goes away. And then there's a magic number, which is 5.5%. And who knows where that comes from? When 5.5% of the oxygen is kind of a missing electron, then superconductivity turns on. We know what the signature is in the magnetism, <coughs> the signals that that's about to happen. But that would take me a little longer to explain. Then it becomes a superconductor over a range of doping, fairly wide range. And then if you put enough in, then the theoretical models, which I disparaged for here, start to work, actually. And so if you're way over here, you do cross over to conventional methods. But this is an amazing phase diagram, and it's extraordinarily rich. And it turns out when you look at the magnetism, what the spins are doing to probe the neutrons, that was all the pictures I skipped by, that you find out that the magnetism is unprecedented. You know, we had never seen microscopic magnetic behavior in any materials uh, before until these were discovered. So even if they weren't superconducting, it turns out that the magnetism is by itself uh, represents entirely new physics. So, and I had a string of graduate students, uh, all of whom have great professorships now, actually, uh, who basically mapped out how the magnetism and some other properties behave as you move across the phase diagram. Actually, my group happened to be the one that first proposed the phase diagram uh, correctly, it turns out, so I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, however, I'm now going to jump to the new materials. I, among others, believe deeply in this approach which came from Bill Anderson you needed to start out with a two-dimensional magnetic insulator. And that was fundamental to the physics of high temperature superconductivity. And all of the work we did, we 
systematic coping is going to resolve based on that. Okay. That's just scattering and coping and And then in 2008, a really remarkable discovery was made, which is that first it was a group in Japan, but then it sort of got taken over by groups in, uh, in China and Shanghai and Beijing of a whole new class of materials that are high temperature superconductors. And these are the so called iron neckties, which again are layered materials, except the layers now have iron and arsenic in them. Still two dimensional iron and arsenic. We don't know where this came from. The TCs are not quite as high. But I said, I emphasize the fact that in this approach we have to the physics of the copper oxide superconductors, it's essential that the parent materials be insulators. And this is not true. The parent materials here are metals. Okay. So that explicitly contradicts the way we thought of it. These are the materials we make here, which may happen in crystal. And I'll show you the phase diagram. So this is the phase diagram, which one of the person in my group worked on, for one of the materials. You have a three-dimensional antiquarial magnet. You get to a concentration that's pretty close to the 0.055 of the copper oxides. Magnetism goes away, and then you turn on high temperature superconductor. So the topology of the phase diagram in these new iron neckties is closely similar, if not identical, to that of the copper oxides. Even though the parent material is a metal, and has apparently a kinetic magnetism, not localized magnetism. So I commented before about the attractiveness of the copper oxides was that we convinced ourselves that we could understand the physics of a layer of copper and oxygen. We could understand the whole, we could then solve the problem. Right? But this now complicates that naive picture because we end up with a newfounded high temperature superconductors with a layer of iron and ar arsenide, except the properties are quite different. Okay. So there therefore must be a theory that's even a level deeper, which doesn't rest on particularities at all. I mean, now the commonality is a two-dimensional two-dimensionality and an antiferromagnetic current state, and nothing more. Okay. So, you know, you either fight them or join them. So, so when this was, uh, Actually, for me, it's uh, uh, a lucky break, actually, because my lab was just starting to go here uh, in 2008, 2009. I worked with Dunghain and some others. Uh, and I, in setting up the lab, we were setting up to grow copper oxide crystals, and we are going to keep going down that line. Uh, uh, but then, as I said, you know, you, you then have to make a decision. So the decision we made is that if this completely contradicts our picture, then we should figure out why it contradicts our picture, which means we should switch our research program and start working on the new materials, okay? which is exactly what we decided to do. Uh, and uh, I won't go through it all, but, but it turns out that, that, that these materials have some properties which are closely similar that's work done by the Manzara and uh, it, it turns out in these materials, there's emerging some universalities that uh, we've been exploring and trying to understand the magnitude of uh, and the structural phase transitions in these materials. Uh, and, but it's at an early stage, uh, so it's really just the beginning of this field of research. Uh, and and we're, after all, only two years old, less than two years old actually, since the first, since the first publication. Uh, and it's very rich, as you can see just by looking at the table here. These are all in this family. It's a very rich system because you can do a lot of crystal chemistry in a lot. It turns out this is a whole huge family of materials oddly had not been explored before from this point of view. Uh, and in fact, it's again a situation where uh, the Japanese scientists who discovered the superactivity, it was accidental and it was trying to produce. Do you remember the story? It was a completely different motivation. Yeah, he was uh, trying to uh, develop some infrared. Yeah, he was trying to develop an infrared detector. So, as part of working on the material, uh, cooled it down and discovered it went superconducting at a very high temperature. But again, Realize that actually quite important. You probably didn't realize how important it is in terms of uh, its relationship. Okay, so apologize for having to go too fast in the end. Uh, but in the iron next time materials, this new family discovered just within the last couple of years. The current are anti-ferromagnetic semi-metals, 
Uh, I didn't explain this, but it turns out the magnetic and structural transitions are intimately connected in a way that's completely new, which I've never seen in any material before. Uh, Antiferromagnetism, or from the spelling should be uh, superconductivity from P. So that's also in the copper oxides. You have competition between antiferromagnetism and superconductivity. Uh, and the phase diagrams have remarkable similarity. So this then produces the natural question, you know, is there some deep universal model which rests on, you know, some very elemental things most, you know, connected with, 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 with the symmetry of the system. And I have a final thing, and uh, this, I prepared this talk actually for the material science department, so this is, uh, uh, you know, a sequence of material scientists, but it also happens to be true. So I was fed by the picture of the person who taught me how to do research, uh, which actually wasn't my thesis advisor, that was fine, but it was a great scientist by the name of Ken Shirani. I had good fortune when I was in my, after I did my PhD of being able to work with him. I ended up working with him for his whole, his whole career. He died a couple of years ago. Uh, and he said, well, two things he said to me that were notable. One is, uh, when I was quite young, uh, he said to me, as the person I worked with, he said, and as a sort of guide for the research we would do together, he said, you know, as an experimenter, there are only two experiments that matter. He said, the first, and the best. He said that the <laughs> ultimate is when they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. I've done the first, I've done the best, I've never got them together in my career. Uh, the second thing he said, uh, which I really appreciated, is that in a long career, many decades, he, did, he was working with one of my graduate students an hour, at age 80, an hour before he had a stroke and died. So he did physics from when he started up until, very productive physics up until the last hour of his life which is how he would have liked it, actually. Uh, and anyway, but he said, I remember talking to him, uh, he wasn't the kind of person to look backwards, but when he was uh, sort of, uh, maybe 10 years ago, he said, looking at his career, he said, he had a low boredom threshold, and he said, every single time that he'd go along, suddenly he realized he was getting bored. He said, some new material would be discovered with extraordinary properties. Uh, and, you know, and then he would switch fields and start working on new, and, and was, you know, and it has been a history of, of uh, talking about, you agree, of solid state physics, right? Uh, for the last 50 years, and each time we, it's, it's like when I told the students in my solid state physics class not to you know, find something else other than superconductivity to work on, and then, you know, that year, copper oxide had discovered the incredible materials research that got done on gallium arsenide materials uh, that, you know, ended up producing quantum quantum polymer. That was, again, came out of the uh, and, and, the other, and then the giant magneto resistance materials, and then now we have these new iron tectons. So, you know, each time you go along, right, we're very fortunate in solid state physics that, that somehow or other, you know, someone is often serendipitous, you know, discovers a material that completely contradicts the paradigm uh, of what, you know, often you've been teaching even in the graduate courses. So, thank you for your attention, I'm happy to answer any questions. When you were mentioning the um, Cooper pairing of the electrons earlier, I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly, but it seems to imply more that they're virtual particles where the electrons are kind of just passing through each other and that thing propagated more than they're actually being a pair of electrons that moved around. Uh, Is that true? No, they are real electrons. Um, I think I might have phrased my question wrong, sorry. Uh, so. It's simply the same pair of electrons are going around wherever this Cooper pair is? Right. So okay. Have, That's my question. K and minus K, so they actually have opposite momentum. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they exist in momentum space. And they have opposite spin. So that's in the traditional superconductors. In, uh, in, in these new materials, uh, they're, they're much closer together, a couple of lattice constants. Uh, and most people now believe that the antiferromagnetic fluctuations are glued holes together, but we can't prove that. 